All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Johnson, and uh, it's a pleasure to welcome us again this week on our weekly Safe O'Clock Health and Safety Interactive Workshop. This is a platform where like-minded death and safety professionals we meet virtually every week, every Thursday by 6 p.m. to discuss a specific topic for the week. So if you are joining us for the first time, you are welcome. And uh, for other of my colleagues, you are also highly welcome. So just like we do every week, we start with a, a brief presentation led by any of our members. So today, I'll be leading the presentation. And uh, after the presentation, we'll take time to uh, comment and share our personal experience and our personal knowledge, ask questions also, and answer ourselves the questions. So today, we are talking about manual handling. That is the topic we are discussing today. So I will be leading the discussion on manual handling. So manual handling simply refers to those uh, type of activity which involves uh, movement of load by persons from one place to the other. So it's in the form of carrying the load or pushing the load or uh, lifting the load, pulling, also holding the load, uh, a heavy load for a long time. It's also part of manual handling activity. So. In this regard, there is always the risk. There is always an uh, economic uh, risk. Okay, so that is what uh, we refer to as manual handling. So in manual handling, there are about uh, four different uh, factors that must be considered. First one is the task. The task uh, talks about how often the job is done or how the, the job is itself is being performed. Either it involves bending, can involve twisting, can involve continuous uh, uh, pushing, okay? So that is, it has to do with the type of task being uh, taken. Now the individual, another factor in manual handling is the individual. The capacity of the individual, the capability of the individual, how hefty he is, how strong or how muscular he is. That is what we look at in the individual uh, 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 factor, okay? Sometimes also you talk about if the individual is experienced, if, it ha if he has done the job before, or this is the first time he's doing this type of job. Now, the other factor that is considered is the load, how heavy the load is, either the load has a grip, or if the load is very smooth or it's bulky or uh, the load is not well balanced. So that's another factor. Another factor is the environment. If the environment is even, if the surface is even, uh, if it's very slippery or uh, there is a windy condition. So the environment is also another factor considered when uh, looking into manual handling activity. Okay, so the, When looking at uh, manual handling, the risk involved in manual handling could include either cuts, because manual handling involves use of the fingers and the hands. So there could be cuts, bruises, there could be fracture also, in case the load uh, hits the, the, the feet, could be fractures. There could also be, uh, other accidents, maybe hitting somebody or colliding with a, an object or maybe because the load is blocking the view. Okay, there's also another risk associated with the musculoskeletal uh, disorder. 
especially because the load is, is heavy. So it's going to affect the muscles, the joints, or the tendons uh, leading to all this back pain or uh, lower back pain, all these uh, MSDs. Okay, so let's look at other. Let's look at the structure of the spine. So because in manual handling, the spine or the uh, skeletal system is majorly where the, the risk is associated to because it involves the moving of the load and the spine itself or the spine, uh, spine itself is not structured in such a way that it can support a very heavy load or it can be bent for a very long time. So that is why we want to look at the structure of the spine from this uh, picture on the screen, you see what is uh, uh, the pointing at the spinal cord. So that is the most, uh, I can say is the most uh, sensitive area or fragile area that if uh, it's destroyed or if it's a uh, damage, then the person's posture is damaged uh, forever. It cannot be able to walk upright uh, again. So that is why we are looking at this structure so that we know that whatever we are doing in manual handling is going to affect the spinal cord and that could lead to permanent disability. So the, the disc and the soft tissues, which is made up of uh, the muscles and the ligaments. Now let's look at the structure of the spine itself. You see this, uh, uh, there is a cervical, uh, uh, cervical curvature, and there is thoracic uh, curvature, and there is a uh, sacral curvature. So, and lumbar curvature. So, these are the. This is how the our spine looks like. It's not straight. So, it's supposed to be this way, and it's not supposed to be altered. Okay, that is why we are looking at this so that. When we start, uh, when uh, workers engage in manual handling activities, we understand that anything that affects this uh, structure of the spine could lead to uh, disability. Now, how is the spine uh, uh, injured? The spine could be injured by injury to the soft tissues or injury to the disc or injuries to the, uh, the bones. Now, how do you get injury today? So there is this degeneration. When somebody gets to uh, age 30, the, the disc keeps losing, starts losing its uh, strength or maybe its uh, uh, stamina. So that is why we need uh, proper orientation on how to maintain and keep balance after this age. Now, this can also lose its water contents, and there's also, there could be poor posture due to continuous lifting. As you continue lifting, the disc itself can get injured and it gets, uh, uh, it gets out of shape. Okay, the soft tissues can also be injured through overstretching. If the activity involves stretching and this stretching continues for a long time, it can injure the soft tissues. The soft tissues can also be injured through overloading. If we overload the soft tissues continuously, uh, it can tear it apart. Okay, and if this uh, there is no adequate time for the soft tissues to recover, you see that because of uh, repetitive motions and repetitive activities you see that there could not be enough time for the soft tissues to recover. And this uh, could lead to this uh, uh, injury to the soft tissues. It will remain expanded. It cannot, it doesn't uh, return to this uh, uh, normal shape anymore. So what are the control measures? The control measures is to prevent uh, injury to the spine by First, we can use the administrative controls, preparing proper risk assessment, assessing uh, the load, assessing the distance of the movement, 
the environment, how the environment is, and the, the capacity of the workers. Okay. Then in, uh, involving job rotation, trying to ensure that one uh, worker doesn't continue doing the same manual activities all the time, rotating workers and maybe uh, reshuffling them, giving them different tasks. Head surveillance, trying to check the condition of the workers, especially before they begin the job and intermediately uh, while the activities are going on, in case they, they continue this activity for a long time. So the head uh, practitioner in the workplace should examine the workers to ensure that they are still uh, fit to work. Then training aware and awareness, educating the workers on proper way or proper techniques to uh, engage in manual handling and how to prevent injury with manual handling. We can also employ engineering controls by automating the job. Instead of you doing the job manually, we can use engineering controls to automate the job. Then design, the workplace can be designed to ensure that uh, it's ergonomically uh, fit for the people to prevent the people uh, maybe twisting, rotating all the time. Okay, then using of uh, uh, general uh, handling aids like pallet trucks, like wheelbarrows, like trolleys. Okay, then ensuring proper supervision because most times if there is no supervisor, you see the workers doing whatever they like and uh, forgetting the uh, safe system of work or the right procedure. So in, uh, providing uh, supervision can help to ensure that they do the job the right way and prevent injury, okay? So what are the uh, manual handling uh, principles? The techniques that can be applied to ensure that manual handling is done without any without any uh, injury. So the first one is the person carrying out the job should be balanced. Staying in an unbalanced uh, environment or maybe an unbalanced uneven surface could also uh, increase the risk associated with manual handling. So there should be proper balance. Then the load should be close to the uh, body should not uh, extend the hands or maybe extend uh, the load away from the body. It will not give uh, the proper center of gravity on the body, thereby affecting the body system. Okay, then the next one is to bend the knees. Bending the knees will help you prevent bending the spine so that you bend the knees and go straight to the load so that all the, the weight of the load will be on the knee, which is more stable and uh, more balanced than the spine. Then the back should be kept straight and the head should be up. So this will ensure that the spine, the structure of the spine is not altered in this uh, process. Okay, then it can now stand up through the feet. So the feet, should be moved while uh, moving the load and not the body. The body should be like, uh, it should be firm, but the, the feet is what should be moved. Then while carrying the load, twisting and moving in haphazard uh, motion will also affect the body. Now let's look at few uh, do's and don'ts. First one is when carrying the load, the back should not be bent. Okay, the feet, the feet uh, should be kept firm and the head should be upright. The grip on the, uh, on the load should be firm, should have a firm grip on the load. The object should be very close to the body and the object uh, should be pulled down in the same uh, posture that it was uh, lifted from. These are some of the bad postures. Bending the spine often 
could uh, help to alter the, the position of the spine, twisting, twisting every, every second or every minute is also a risk uh, factor in manner handling. Overreaching. Overreaching is a very uh, high risk uh, factor in manner handling of patients. So proper uh, working platform should be made available so that the people can uh, sufficiently reach where they want to keep the load without overreaching. Now, a manner handling aids like trolleys, uh, pallets, and uh, wheelbarrows should be used in moving the loads to prevent uh, carrying heavy loads. Okay, so that is that is the end of my presentation, and uh, I will then allow us to contribute. Okay, Sammy, you are welcome. Now the, the floor is open. We can make a uh, Thank you very much. Really, uh, this manual handling, one of the very good topic that you choose in the construction side. Uh, manual handling is a, is, a, is a very good topic and it is very useful for the person who is uh, doing the manual handling. But uh, in my area where I'm working in Saudi Arabia, Star Yard, so manual handling, we are giving more important in this manual handling because, because most of our workers are involved to shifting material here and there. Yes, we have a we have a lifting aids also available, but some of places where there is a congested places where it is not possible to, to use any mechanical device. So that time we are using <clears throat> workers to do the manual handling. And we are we have organized we in our organization we have a manual handling handling program we are uh, conducting campaign we are giving good presentation training to the workforce uh, related to the manual handling. Thank you. All right, thank you, Samir, for that uh, wonderful contribution. Okay, David, your hand is raised. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I have a, it's like a contribution and also uh, an observation. Uh, this manual handling, it's uh, really it's a safety concern that should be addressed from the top management because uh, in my company, for instance, the recruitment process does not consider the fact that a certain age limit is more exposed to the effects of manual handling. They don't consider the age. They consider the experience and other things. They don't consider the age factor. Secondly, due to the fact that they want progress, they subject most of the workers, they place them on a contract. They place them on a contract to finish this without uh, considering the effects of this, this kind of, uh, of condition. They place them on contract. And when you place someone on contract, he tries to deliver. And when you are trying to deliver a task assigned to you, you do it with all zeal. You put all your efforts. You don't give less priority to your body language. You just try to deliver so that you will accomplish the mission and get the bonus. So this is a factor that affects the workers, which they, they might not know what this is doing to them at the moment. But over time, 
they begin to understand that they have subjected themselves to too much pressure, shifting, pulling, especially those involved in messing works. So this manual handling should be addressed from the top manager. They need to try and put a hold on this contract base, the place uh, the workers on, because they think they are getting the progress that way because maybe one person is supposed to like deliver 100 blocks and the other guy is supposed to install 100 blocks. <laughs> they are getting the progress. But over time, the, the workers who are involved in this particular task, they, they are the ones that suffer the consequence. And also the age factor. Because from your presentation, the body the, this starts degenerating at the age of 30. And when you are employing someone at the age of 35 and subjecting them to manual handling, they will definitely feel the effect because they are, they are paid to do a job and they have to do the job. And they are trying to impress their bosses, so they have to do the job. So it's an issue that should be addressed to the top management. They should factor these things in the recruitment process and change the idea of work so that the people working will not be subjected to the effects the negative consequences of manual handling. Thank you. Thank you, brother, for that uh, wonderful contribution. That is part of what we uh, suffer in this in this uh, part of the world. And uh, in response to that, what I will say is, now, if the workers are uh, more enlightened, about the risk factors or what could be the after effect of manner handling, then most of them will reject that uh, that type of activity that will subject them to stress or maybe that will uh, uh, that will uh, make them to work beyond their capacity. So I think you rightly said that man uh, the management the top management should take a a decisive decision on this. Then on our own part, while we are still getting the management to be involved on our own part, we should ensure that we do a proper training or a proper awareness to the workers to let them know what they are exposing themselves to. Because they are not going to be in that uh, company or that contract forever. So when the contract is finished, when they are back home, so this is what they are going to feel in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years time. So with continuous awareness and continuous training, some of them that uh, understand what we are talking about will start rejecting that type of uh, activity or maybe that type of uh, uh, pressured job. Because if the job is done smoothly or is done easily with maybe uh, two people lifting the block at the same time, you see that the load will be reduced and the effect of the manual handling will not uh, catch up with them so quick. So, but uh, taking up that contract, I agree with you. I know I have experienced it before. Taking up the contract will make them, they want to do everything on themselves and they will be doing it haphazardly with very uh, fast and in that process, a lot of uh, injuries could uh, also occur. So you are right, and it's a message to us all to ensure that we get our management involved to uh, educate some of them that that claims that they don't know that there is a risk factor associated with manual handling. All right, uh, the floor is open for other contribution. Yeah, David, your hand is up. All right, uh, good evening to everyone. Um, I just want to make just a contribution anyway. So um, regarding uh, my namesake, like what he said, uh, in my own case, what I usually do at site is when I see a situation whereby um, the workers involved you know, there is a, an age factor, you know, age factor is playing and the load they are trying to lift or carry or uh, transfer or push 
it's very heavy for the person. What I usually do is to recommend to the supervisor to change the person, you know, performing that task. I mean, he should reassign the task to maybe the youngest worker there, you know, of age, because that person uh, will be more energetic, you know, have more strength uh, to carry, to push that load. So that's what I basically do. I would just speak with the supervisor and say, look, considering the age of this person and this load, you know, um, I think in your team, look for the youngest person and reassign this tax to that person. Uh, secondly, uh, in the work site, this issue of, um, you know, manual handling hazard is being overlooked. Even in my workplace, you know, uh, there was a certain time we even overlooked it. When we were even doing the, the risk assessment, I think it's not even considered until we started uh, experiencing some, uh, recording some incident that has to do with, you know, manual handling, no matter how minor those incidents could be, but we realized then that uh, we've neglected, uh, totally neglected manual handling and we had to go back again, start reviewing you know, job safety analysis just to capture the manual handling hazard and address it. Um, and also, like the point I said I want to bring in is, uh, I think as far um, international standard, let me just put it, whether OSHA or uh, Health and Safety Executive, uh, usually I think uh, May are not supposed to lift any load that exceeds 25 kg. All right, that's for the male. Then why for the female? I think uh, 15 kg. So maximum, um, they shouldn't, uh, females shouldn't lift any load that exceeds 15 kg. Why for the male, for the men, should not uh, exceed uh, 25 kg. And if it does, maybe between 25 to 50, then the person needs to call for an additional support, you know. Uh, that load needs to be lifted by two persons. So overall, uh, following the presentation, I think uh, everything was covered in the presentation. Everything was covered in the presentation. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. David, for that wonderful contribution. Yeah, so that is... Uh, that uh, load limit is also what is applicable here. But uh, I think some in our workplace, like in my previous workplace, in our uh, manner handling uh, operation uh, guide, we stated that it's 20 kg um, maximum load that one person can lift. So that uh, is to help to ensure that people don't uh, lift heavy loads themselves which will help to protect their, their spine and ensure that manner handling the risk are reduced. Okay, we can take one or two more contribution. Hello. Yeah. yeah. My own contribution yeah. is based on, uh, you know, we are talking about um, our workers not being trained. Some of these workers, some of them are trained. Some of them will even call you, safety, can you come over to this place? There's something going on. And when we come there, you see that these workers, because they've been trained, because they know the hazard, they will tell us, we can't do this work because the manpower is less. We need this, we need that. Then when you call on the, the foreman or the engineer that, my friend, this thing is, cannot be done this way. They need more manpower or they need more equipment. The engineer or the supervisor will tell you, we don't have. So what are we going to do? So like the brother said, David, you know, management need to do more, you know, to help in this kind of uh, situations. But most of, you know, you know, we, we are here in Qatar. Most of this management don't even care about workers. You know, they care about the work, the work, they need uh, progress. So in this situation, you know, safety also are helpless, you know. 
the papers, the document as there, you know, risk assessment, the training is being conducted. The workers, they know, but from the civil side, they're not doing anything. So management need to, you know, do more like my brother David said. So that's what I want to contribute. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Henry. See, the, the issue is it's almost everywhere. And you see that any uh, management that is responsible or that pays attention to the health and safety of the workers, they gain more because the workers will be happy and they will do the job even uh, easier than it's supposed to be. But the management that ignores the workers the workers will find also a way. They will find a way to delay that job. Some of them that uh, uh, think that they will give them contracts and they will finish the job so quick, but they will still find a way to delay the job. They might uh, uh, intentionally do some mistakes. For example, during block lay, they might intentionally uh, 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 remove it from plumb or remove it from the line. So that at the end of the day, when the client comes and they didn't pass QA, uh, QS, QC inspection, they will start afresh. So these workers, they are also smart. They also know how to uh, deal with the management that is not taking care of their health and safety. So we, uh, our job as health and safety professional is we don't stop. When we uh, uh, recommend it didn't work out, we we'll recommend it again. We we'll keep bringing it up in the uh, coordination meetings. we we'll keep bringing it up in two boss talk, in committee meetings, in health and safety progress meetings, in emails, in memos. we we'll keep bringing the issue up. We we'll don't stop until something is done. So that is, uh, don't get discouraged. And we are not supposed to get discouraged because that is why we are employed. And the reason why we are employed is to do this thing. So don't get discouraged, or none of us should get discouraged because of the type of response you get. Sometimes you get favorable response, sometimes you don't get favorable response, but we'll keep trying and we'll keep uh, pushing uh, because we are more interested in the health and safety of the workers. Okay, so that is my own uh, word of encouragement to us. Yeah, it's correct. We never give up until we not achieve our target. Exactly. We will not give up. There is, there is a situation, there is a, a time that will come. You will recommend everything and nobody will listen to you. You will give a closeout date. That date will come and the a closeout is not yet implemented. Yet you will not give up. You will follow up again. The supervisor did not listen. You go to his engineer. The engineer didn't do much, you go to his manager. The manager didn't do much, you go to a corporate. So we'll keep pushing until we get results. So we'll not give up. Yeah, that's why we have also one program that is called Steering Committee Meeting, which we are conducted with the management and we all highlighted the observation, which is, uh, which is not closed by supervisor and superintendent, engineer then we will highlight this this kind of observation to the top management exactly and yeah so they will aware and they will give us the solution and the due date that when they will going to close so that's why we are conducting every month this steering committee meeting with the top management exactly that is a very good approach because uh one thing i also have to advise our uh, practitioners is don't be too lenient on the supervisors, maybe because, or the engineers, maybe because they are your friends. They don't close issues and you close your mouth. Don't close your mouth, you have to escalate it. If the engineer or the supervisor didn't close the issue when it's supposed to, escalate it to the manager. If the manager didn't uh, close the issue, if you have a corporate meeting with client or with the uh, corporate head, escalate the issue. Let the issue keep escalating until they get solution. Because if an accident happens because of that issue, they will also blame you. They will even find a way to uh, exonerate themselves. They will find a way to pin it on you. 
So don't give them that uh, break, or maybe you try to uh, 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 give them more time. Just keep pushing it to their uh, top. Don't just say uh, because they are your friends or because you you want to be in good terms with them, you don't push the observation up. You have to escalate it until it gets to the highest place where you will get results. Because if an issue happens, it will still bounce on you. So I thank the people that have contributed. Do we have more contributions? Who is uh, Afofem? Afofem, you are joining uh, for the first time. I've not seen your name before. This is Femio. Afofem has always been here. Ah, but this is not the, the name that you see. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Good evening, Thank you. Okay. If there is no further uh, contribution, we'll call it a day. There is no need to keep us uh, waiting. All right, guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your contributions. David, so David, Fair, that is true, David. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Femi, James, uh, uh, Samir. Where is uh, Emmanuel? Emmanuel has left. Okay, Emmanuel is here. So, guys, thank you for coming. Uh, next week, we discuss again. I will try to share the topic on time so that somebody, anybody that wants to prepare presentation will prepare. So I'll try to share the topic of time. All right. Do have a blessed day. Yeah, you too. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sammy. Right, thank you. Thank you. Just send me a message so that I will put your name in certificates. As usual, I'm always sending on your WhatsApp. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>